I am pleased to introduce Dr. Rebecca Campbell to give this year's annual lecture for the Division of Prevention and Community Research. Dr. Campbell is a professor of psychology at Michigan State University, where she also completed her doctorate in ecological community psychology with minors in statistics and women's studies. Dr. Campbell's research examines how contact with the legal and medical systems affects adult, adolescent, uh, and pediatric victims' psychological and physical health. For the past 25 years, she has been conducting community-based research on violence against women and children with an emphasis on sexual assault. Given that her findings suggest that these experiences are often highly traumatic and re-victimizing, a secondary aim in her work is evaluating programs and policies to, comp to improve the community response to sexual assault. She's a prolific author, publishing widely in peer-reviewed journals, in chapters and books, and in technical reports in the area of sexual assault, violence, methodology, and ethics. She is also the recipient of numerous research grants as principal investigator or co-investigator that examine law enforcement, judicial, and or community response to sexual assault. This work has been supported by the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the National Institute of Justice, NIMH, NSF, the CDC, and the Michigan Department of Community Health. Dr. Campbell is also a nationally recognized trainer on topics of sexual assault, program evaluation, and the neurobiology of trauma. She has trained for the U.S. Air Force, International Association of Chiefs of Police, the International Association of Forensic Nurses, and the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, and has also trained law enforcement personnel in several major urban areas. She is a co-creator of the CDC's Rape Prevention Education Manual, a national prevention model, and has served as an evaluation consultant on the Federal Violence Against Women's Act. Dr. Campbell is currently associate editor of the American Journal of Community Psychology and the American Journal of Evaluation and has served on the editorial board or as a reviewer for more than 20 journals. She's also the recipient of a number of honors and awards for her research, teaching, and service. For example, she has received a U.S. Department of Justice Office for Victims of Crime Vision 21 Crime Victims Research Award, an Outstanding Evaluation Award from the American Evaluation Association, and an Outstanding Educator Award from Division 27 of the American Psychological Association. We are very pleased to have Dr. Campbell talk with us today about shelving justice, understanding the problem of untested sexual assault kits. Dr. Campbell. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate the uh, invitation to be here. And as I was joking with folks while we were getting set up, I really love what you've done with the place. It's, uh, whew, it's warm. <laughs> I'm gonna do the best I can to be entertaining to keep us all awake, um, um, but if you do drift off, I'll just um, throw a remote at you, so, um, so hang in there with me. So um, I appreciate the invitation from Jack to be here today. Hospitality has been wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to talk to you about the problem of untested rape kits, and I'm gonna tell you what a rape kit is in a few minutes. Um, and this is a project I've been working on in Detroit, and I now literally crisscross the country dealing with this issue in all 50 states. This is not going to be a standard academic talk. It's not a standard ground rounds talk. I'm gonna tell you a story, okay? So there's no introduction, methods, results, discussion, implications, it's a story, it's narrative. I'm gonna tell you a story about a violent crime. I'm gonna tell you a story about sexual assault. Um, given the topic here, I've been very careful not to put in gratuitous details about sexual assault or specific stories or things like that. So I've been trying to be very conscious about triggers and the fact that I'm always speaking to an audience where I know I have survivors. So I wanna to speak to them and to everyone else here to say I did the very best I could on trying to make this um, a comfortable space for everybody. At the same time, I'm gonna piss you off, okay? This is a really, really awful thing that I'm gonna be talking to you about. You're gonna get mad because this is a massive human rights violation. Not just the crime of sexual assault, but what happens to victims when they report. So it is not going to be a happy story by any means. It's also gonna be a story about community psychology. As Jack indicated to you, I'm a community psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, I work with communities. And I have to work with communities sometimes that I don't like, and sometimes with community partners I'm pretty darn angry at. And you have to stay in partnership with them, and you have to keep working through that to create the kind of change that needs to happen. It's also gonna be a story about organizational psychology. I'm gonna be talking about massive systems and organizations that have deep-seated problems. You have to delve very, very deep into organizational practices and norms to create change. And finally, it's a story about using research to create change. Not research for the sake of research, 
but research that is very specifically planned, designed, and implemented to create social change. So to that end, it's also going to be a story about some successes, things that went well. It's also going to be a story about failures. And it's going to be a story about the cycle of success and failure, of when you think you've got it, and then it fails, and then you think you've got it, and then it fails again. And it reminds me a lot of that Greek myth, um, a Sisyphus, as you may remember, whose, whose uh, task or curse, depending upon how you look at it, was to push this enormous boulder up. And every time when he got to the top, it was always that wonder. It's like, is this going to take this time? When I push this uphill this time, is it going to stay? Or is it going to roll over, you know, and, and, or roll over and get us to the next side? Or is it going to roll right back on me? Okay? And that's kind of the metaphor for what I'm going to be talking about today is Sisyphus's journey of pushing something uphill, not sure whether it's going to work or whether it's going to roll right back down on top of you. So with that introduction, um, let's go ahead and get started on our story. And to start our story um, about a social problem, let's begin with defining the problem. And we talk about this a lot in community psychology, that how you define the problem is going to have profound impact on where you proceed, what types of interventions you try um, to address the problem. So let's start right here with what this problem is. So back in the 1980s, research on sexual assault started coming out with this very robust finding that when victims reported to the police, and again, not all victims report, but of the victims of sexual assault who did report to the police, most of them aren't prosecuted. In fact, most of them weren't investigated. In fact, pretty much nothing happened. And so what we started seeing in the 1980s in study after study in large jurisdictions, small jurisdictions, is that when victims reported to the police, pretty much nothing happened, and the criminal justice system didn't do anything with their cases. So if this is the problem that we're trying to solve, um, what would be potential solutions? Well, there's obviously many solutions that you could try to think of to try to address the problem of the criminal justice system not taking this crime seriously. But one of the issues that was started in the 1980s was this problem of evidence. What evidence do we have that could substantiate a victim's assertion that she, he, or they had been sexually assaulted? Well, maybe medical evidence. Sexual assault is a crime against the body. It's a crime against the soul. It's a crime against a person, which means the person is a crime scene, which means there's physical, biological evidence on and inside a victim's body that could be collected, could be analyzed, and that evidence might be the tipping point, again, that idea of a tipping point, to make police and prosecutors move forward with cases. The idea that this evidence could sort of bolster, could support a victim's assertion of what happened to them, and then with that additional medical forensic evidence, then we would have enough evidence and we would solve this problem of under, under prosecution. So with that logic, in the 1980s, um, the nursing profession, medical profession, started creating what are called rape kits. It is a box, usually, um, that contains inside of it various envelopes and swabs. And so the idea was is after a sexual assault, a victim would be instructed to go to a hospital emergency department where um, a healthcare practitioner, typically would be an ER resident, could be a nurse, would go through the steps of this kit and would take samples from the victim's body. So would do uh, vaginal swabs, penile swabs, breast swabs, body swabs, oral cavity swabs, you know, fingernail uh, under the nail scratching things, anything they could find from the victim's body would be systematically collected and taken into custody as evidence. And this would be a rape kit. And the idea and the hope was is, is that this evidence, this physical, tangible, biological evidence would help substantiate victims' assertions and this would be additional evidence that could be presented in court. So that's the plan, that's the idea. We create <laughs> the kits in the 1980s, we push the boulder uphill and what happened? Rolls right back down. Had no impact on prosecution rates, none. Had no demonstrable impact on police investigation rates, prosecution rates, nothing. So most of the assaults that are reported to the police are still not being prosecuted. And in the midst of trying to solve that problem, we created another problem. This is some uh, quotes from some research I did in the early 2000s on what victims said about that medical forensic exam and that evidence collection kit. They described that process as being re-raped. They described it as degrading and humiliating. 
They describe the process of that evidence collection as violating. And one survivor said, it's awful, but if it's what I need to do to put him away, then I'll do it. It's like, well, crap, that wasn't what we intended at all. We've created another burden, another layer. It's like, oh, if you really were sexually assaulted, if you really want to prosecute, now you have to go through this other hoop of having all of this evidence collected. And if you really want to see the, per the assailant prosecuted, then you need to go through this. So obviously, we've taken one problem, and now we've made it worse. So what do we do about that? So in the 1990s, 2000s, we now have two things we have to tackle. We're still trying to deal with this issue that most of the assaults that are reported to the police are not going to be prosecuted. And we have medical forensic exams that are now expected practice that are incredibly re-traumatizing to victims. So the solution for the second problem was actually pretty straightforward. And the clicker just died. And Oh, Trisha. The clicker just decided to go. It was at this real dramatic moment where we were going to see how we were going to fix this problem of medical forensic exams, and the clicker doesn't work. And the, it thing. must be the heat. It must be the heat. I got to say, the, it's really fabulous up here under the lights. <laughs> well, look at that. Yeah, Let's no, it, it, it's really, no, it's, it's, it's Is everything grows up. All right. Let's try if we do that. All right, go ahead to that slide. I'll wait till you get to that. Okay. Yeah. So this, the problem of the traumatizing exams was relatively straightforward to fix. The, the nursing profession stood up and said, we've got this. Okay. When you go to a hospital emergency department, um, chances are the people there are going to be really great if you're having a heart attack or an emerging uh, you know, medical health problem. This is probably not a life-threatening situation. We can create within the ERs, within our healthcare clinics, a different setting where specially trained nurses will do medical forensic exams, really attend to victims' psychological needs, do crisis intervention, assess physical health and injuries, address risk of pregnancy for female victims, sexually transmitted infections for all victims, and then do this medical forensic collection in a very calm, patient-centered way. So we thought, okay, this will work, and we started implementing SANE programs in the 1990s. And I'm going to try and get you a new battery, but let's go with that for now. Okay, so the impact of this was good. Okay, so we fixed that problem. In evaluations that I've done that's been replicated by other teams, victims who have exams and sexual assault nurse examiner programs describe that experience as incredibly helpful in healing, and it actually sort of helped them feel more engaged and more willing to withstand the, the difficulties of the criminal justice system. And it was a really important linkage to care and getting them to uh, community mental health centers and other um, psychological treatment that they might need. But it still is a pretty invasive exam, let's face it. We can make it easier, but it is still the expectation that victims will go have this exam. And I think that still remains a fair critique of this particular solution to the problem, is, is that we're still asking survivors to take a very invasive physical exam within 72 hours after a very physically invasive crime. But so it goes. Now, another solution that became available in the 1990s and 2000s was DNA testing. We'll okay. try it. New battery. Okay. Oh, awesome. Okay. So we now have nursing doing a better job on the evidence collection. Now in the 1990s, we actually have better options for the evidence analysis itself because we now have DNA testing now being available in context of forensics and the emergence of what's called CODIS. CODIS is the National FBI's criminal database. So in 1994, the FBI created CODIS. So when an offender was uh, arrested or convicted of felony crimes, that individual would have to give a buckle swab um, of, their, of his or her, their cheek. And that reference sample would go into CODIS to say this is the DNA profile of a known offender, someone who's been convicted or possibly arrested of a very serious crime. And the idea was is it would sit there in Quantico. I've actually seen CODIS, got to touch CODIS once. It's kind of cool. It's a big old mainframe. And the idea was is, is that all around the country, when you have unsolved crimes or evidence from crime scenes, you could develop a DNA profile, enter it into CODIS, and see if there's a match. And it might be able to give you a, an investigational lead. So with the DNA evidence option, the meaning and the value of rape kits really changed. 
Before we had DNA, they could do ABO blood typing. They could do some very limited forensic work with it, but honestly, it wasn't going to be a whole lot of help um, in terms of identifying offenders. But with DNA, this became a game changer. So let's talk a little bit more about what forensic DNA analysis of a rape kit could do for police and prosecutors, because I want you to really sort of appreciate what this shift was that we had in the 1990s and 2000s. So obviously in a sexual assault that is perpetrated by a stranger, so the victim doesn't know who assaulted them, DNA testing and a match through that federal DNA database has the potential to identify the offender. It can give you back a name. This is the DNA, this is the name of the person who's the possible suspect in this crime. So very, very powerful in terms of solving crimes for stranger perpetrated sexual assaults. The other thing that DNA evidence could do is it could help in non-stranger sexual assault cases. So in that situation, the victim knows who assaulted them. They said it was so-and-so. The identity of the offender isn't in question, but that DNA evidence could still establish that there was physical contact, that there was sexual contact between the victim and the, um, the assailant. And it can be very helpful in a case where an assailant says, ah, I didn't do it, I didn't touch her, I didn't touch him, not me, not me. It's like, yeah, it is you, look, here's your DNA. So even in those situations where identity is not necessarily in question, DNA testing could still be very helpful in moving a case through the criminal justice system. Now in all types of sexual assaults, both stranger, non-stranger, DNA evidence has the potential to identify serial perpetrators through DNA matches across multiple cases. So let's pause and talk about this for a second. So in any individual non-stranger sexual assault case, meaning I know who the assailant is, police might say, yeah, we don't need to test this sexual assault kit. The identity of the offender isn't in question. No point in testing it. So they don't test the kit. Then you come to another case and it's like, oh, you know what? We don't need to look at DNA analysis here. The victim knows who the assailant is. There's no point in this and then the next one and the next one. What DNA evidence can do is, is when you do test it, it will start matching the kits. He said, she said, she said, she said. He said, he said, he said, he said. You can, you know, she said, you can go through all of the various pronouns to reflect all the different communities who are victims of sexual assault. It's a way of finding serial perpetration. In each individual case, the identity might not be in question, but when you DNA test and start matching, you see a pattern of criminal offending that you didn't otherwise see. So it has real potential here for police and prosecutors and suspected serial sexual assaults. And then of course, perhaps the most important thing that DNA evidence can do is it can exonerate someone who's been falsely accused. If someone says, I did not do this, I was not there, and their DNA is not found, that's very compelling evidence. Or someone else's DNA is found. So we have real potential here in terms of identifying perpetrators, identifying serial perpetrators, and exonerating individuals who have been falsely accused of crimes they did not commit. So DNA has huge potential, big game changer in the 1990s and 2000s for the criminal justice system response to sexual assault. So we're gonna push this rock uphill, right? DNA testing of rape kits, surely this will work, right? So what was the impact? Police still not investigating reported cases, Cases are still not moving forward for prosecution. And then in uh, mid-2000s, a major report comes out of the World Health Organization on the uses and impacts of medical legal forensic evidence, a global review. Guess what this review finds? DNA evidence is rarely, if ever, used in sexual assault investigations, prosecutions, and court trials. It's not used, it's not there. Massive review, multiple nations, what, what evidence is being used in court and prosecutions of sexual assault? It's not medical forensic evidence. So then the question becomes, where the hell are all of those rape kits? Because we've been systematically collecting them now since the 1980s. It became standard practice. Go to the hospital emergency department. Have a rape kit collected. Have a rape kit collected. And then this review says, they're not showing up in court, so where are they? Well, let's talk about where they were. So the late 1990s, some media outlets in New York City started reporting on a story that there was 12,000 untested rape kits in storage. So 12,000 victims in New York City had been assaulted, had gone to the hospital, had a rape kit collected. 
The police picked up the kit and instead of sending it to a laboratory for DNA analysis, they put it in storage. And they did that 12,000 times. Not long thereafter, Human Rights Watch starts poking around in Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles. They find about 16,000 untested rape kits that again were collected and just put in storage. Nothing happened with them. And as those two stories were breaking in media, media in other cities started saying, huh, I wonder what's happening here? What's going on in the rape kits in our towns? And there were little local sort of coverage stories in a lot of different cities about this issue. And about that time, the National Institute of Justice was paying attention to what was happening in New York, was happening in Los Angeles, was following the news trends in some of these other cities and said, you know, I think we might have a problem with untested rape kits. And that's a key piece of evidence that could help improve the prosecution of sexual assault. So we need to take a closer look at this. So in 2010, the National Institute of Justice released a RFP, Request for Proposals, to do research on the problem of untested rape kits. And they very specifically framed the RFP as an action research project. And I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. But the idea here was is, is that it was going to be a community researcher partnership. That we needed to bring a community together with a researcher, work together to study this issue of untested rape kits. So they put the call out, the solicitation out, and basically, you know, it was like, if you have untested rape kits and you think you have a research partner who could help you with this, put your hand in the air. So Detroit and Houston put their hands in the air and they said, yep, we have a lot of untested rape kits. And then as that project started unfolding, other cities became, started publicly disclosing they also had large numbers of kits. Um, Portland, Salt Lake, Phoenix, San Antonio, and on and on and on to where this is what the current map looks like. You'll notice some of those are entire states. So next week I fly to the state of Alaska. They haven't been testing rape kits there systematically for decades. The entire state of Michigan, turns out, has not been testing kits. The entire state of Wisconsin. We are seeing in large urban cities, in small rural jurisdictions, in college towns, and everything in between, decades and decades of police taking rape kits into custody, not sending them to the lab, and literally just putting them on a shelf. We don't have a good estimate of how big this problem is. Our best estimate is, is that it's likely hundreds of thousands. Best guess, 400,000 untested rape kits are sitting on police storage lockers all throughout the United States. This is very much a national scale problem. By the way, you have them here in Connecticut. State of Connecticut is one of the sites, cities and uh, states, excuse me, that's put its hand in the air and said, well, we've not been testing our rape kits either. So what can we do about this? So let's go back to 2010. The idea of what NIJ had in mind was, this is probably a national problem. And we can try to tackle it on the national level, but maybe another way to do this is to focus in depth on a couple of cities, understand what's happening in those, and see if there are transportable lessons learned. Are there key principles, key things we could learn in a couple of cities that would help us address this issue nationally? And again, Detroit was one of those cities that said, we have kids, we're willing to do this. And I was the research partner in the Detroit project. So let's talk a little bit about Detroit. Let's talk a little bit about Detroit's untested rape kits and the work that I did there. So Detroit is one city among many. And of course, Detroit has its own sort of stereotypes and perceptions. It's Detroit. It's bankrupt. It literally did go bankrupt. It went bankrupt in the midst of this project. It was a really, really awful day to be sitting there in our team meeting when the bankruptcy was announced and I'm sitting there with everybody who's funded by the city and their pensions. It, it's, it's a very broke city. It is a predominantly African American city. It has a very high federal crime rate, FBI crime rate. It has tremendous poverty. It has tremendous culture. It has tremendous dignity. It has tremendous infrastructure of community organizations, churches, and people who deeply, deeply care about this city. So it is an interesting mix of the best and the worst of large urban areas. So it may not be representative, nah, it isn't representative of other US cities, but it is one that was willing to say, we will look in depth at what we have done, and we hope that what we have done here will help other cities throughout the United States. 
So they plunged in and said, let's, let's take a look at what we've done wrong in our city. So let me tell you a little bit of the story of how it came to be known that Detroit had untested rape kits. And that story starts in 2008. The Detroit Police Department had its own crime lab, which is actually very common in a lot of uh, large urban police, juris, uh, police departments. But in September of 2008, the state closed the police department's crime lab because they had an unacceptably high error rate in ballistics testing, and they were just in general concern with how the DPD crime lab was handling and processing evidence. This is a very easy statement to say. It is a massive scandal. It is a massive problem. You end up on the news. The crime lab is shut down for a high error rate. Every defense attorney in Wayne County went, hello, okay, because everything is now open for, oh, well, what testing did you do? Who did the testing? When was the testing done? This is a major scandal to have an entire crime lab shut down. And then the state police had to step in and take ownership, custody of all of the crime scene evidence, the tested, the untested, the everything in storage. And it was a massive undertaking. So in terms of trying to get their arms around understanding how, what kind of problem did we inherit, in August of 2009, representatives from the state police, the local police, the prosecutor's office went to Detroit to basically say, okay, let's see it. What have you got? How much crime scene evidence are we talking about? And they were invited to tour Detroit Police Department uh, remote property storage facility. And that's what this is here. It was a parking garage, okay? This was a previously abandoned parking garage in inner city Detroit that the police had taken over. So you would put those two bays up, roll them up, and you would drive in. And as you would go up and down this parking lot in the spaces where cars used to be would be boxes and bins of crime scene evidence. They literally put it in a parking lot. So one of the prosecutors who's, I mean, first of all, just horrified that the evidence is literally in a parking lot, is sort of walking through, trying to get his eyes around, trying to get his head around what he's seeing. And he described what happened that day to me like this. He said, we were walking through, and I see these like steel shelving units with boxes, and I say, what are those? And they said, those are rape kits. And I said, rape kits? What are all those rape kits doing here? I estimated 10,000 or more. And I asked, are they tested or untested? And the officer said, I don't know. So it doesn't take long after that before you end up here, Detroit Free Press. Wayne County prosecutor wants an independent investigation into what she says may be thousands of kits holding untested evidence. This was, again, another major scandal that broke in Detroit, 10,000 rape kits sitting literally in a parking lot. And again, in the amazing timing of the world, that's when the NIJ solicitation came out and the prosecutor said, we are applying for this. We are going to study this. We are going to get these kits tested. We need to understand what went wrong and why. She reached out to partners in the state and she said, literally, find me a rape researcher. And they're like, oh, we're in luck. There's one right down here at Michigan State. Her name's Becky Campbell. She's been doing research on the criminal justice system to sexual assault. She's like, oh yeah, I think I met her once. I come down and she says, we need to write a grant and it's due in about 10 days. So in an academic audience, you can appreciate what that felt like. In their world, they're like, that's nine days more than you need. And I'm like, oh, it's about nine weeks what I really needed. So I'm like, okay, great, we're gonna write a grant. Um, sure, I know how to write an NIJ grant, um, here we go. And the solicitation said this needed to be an action research project. And I'm like, oh, whew, I know what that model is. So for those of you who are not as familiar with what that model is, it's a different way of thinking about research. The way we're often trained in research is to think about, oh, we're gonna do this study, and we're gonna pay a lot of attention to the generalizability of our sample and our methods and, and all of these things so that we'll come up with some type of information that can later be applied, could be generalized, might be replicated, and might, down the road, help create change. Action research doesn't have that kind of timeline. Action research is, that's a lovely idea, but we have a problem right now. Right now, right here. This city may or may not be representative. Doesn't matter. It has a problem. Use your skills as a researcher to fix this problem, not down the road, right now. 
There's an urgency, there's an immediacy to action research. It's not about, oh, I'm addressing a gap in the literature, this could help inform, you know all those things we write in the discussion section? You don't get to write any of those anymore because it is like right now you are gonna fix this and you're gonna have to make decisions. You're gonna have to make decisions based on data and you're gonna have to make your best guess based on the data that you have what is the right way to go through something, implement it, evaluate it, and see if you're right or wrong. If you're right, go to implementation. If you're wrong, go back and do it again. It's a very different way of thinking about research. So I'm like, I got this, we'll apply for this grant. Our first goal in the research project, action research project was to assess the scope of the problem because I didn't know. And I want everyone here who's written a grant to sort of think about that moment of where you're writing a grant and you have to write that obligatory section, what is the scope of your problem? And your answer is, I don't know. You're like, hmm, goal number one <laughs> is to assess the scope of the problem. You know, and all I had for that section was, police, was the media report saying, we think it's about 10,000. So the first thing we need to do is go in and find out what the true scope of the problem is, but we know we have a problem. Second, we need to understand the root causes. If you wanna fix something, you need to understand what went wrong. So we have to go in and understand how it came to be, like, like really let this sink in. What led to an organization deciding to put a bunch of evidence literally in a parking lot? What was the organizational decision making and policies and practices that led to that outcome? How did we get there? Third thing we needed to do was a testing plan. Many of, the, many of these cases were still within the statute of limitations. What are we gonna do about them? I called up forensic scientists. I said, hey, it's been stored in a parking lot. Is the DNA still gonna be useful? They're like, oh yeah, DNA is indestructible pretty much. As long as they didn't blow torch it, you can probably still test it. I'm like, okay, then we need to come up with a testing plan. Obviously in this situation, with, uh, in this context, with psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, we gotta tell the victims. They had a medical forensic exam. They thought their kit was being tested. It wasn't. We're gonna to have to reach out to them and tell them what happened. We're gonna to have to have a victim notification plan. That is an awful thing to think about. And the good part though, was is we got to think explicitly about policy reform. A federal funder said, you need to think about policy reform. You need to start implementing policy changes and evaluate them, not down the road right now. I'm like, hey, I can get on board with this. Now, in the time that I have with you today, I can't go through all of these things. I'm just gonna give you a snapshot and I'm not gonna be able to talk about victim notification. That is a, literally a talk in and of itself. I'm happy to do Q&A on that when we get to there. But I wanna give you a snapshot of what we did find in all of these and what it's starting to tell us about the national problem. So let's start with the scope. Again, this is all I have to go on. I guess there were 10,000. Are they tested? Are they untested? I don't know. And I thought to myself, how can you not know? How can you not know? Um, it's actually very easy that they did not know. They did have a police database, a police property database. It is a very simple database that just tags each piece of evidence and the date that it was taken into custody. That's it. I'm like, okay, uh, where's your testing database so that we would know when something was submitted to your crime lab? They're like, well, we don't really have a database, but so-and-so has been keeping an Excel spreadsheet on her desktop. I'm like, can I meet her? <laughs> a lovely person, and she's like, yeah, I've been maintaining this spreadsheet for years. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. I'm like, can I see how you track it? She's like, well, I use a laboratory ID number. I'm like, does that laboratory ID number connect over here? Oh, no. I'm like, hmm, okay. All right, so this idea that scope is going to be a couple of database queries and a couple of crosswalks. I've got IT all lined up, and IT's like, ooh, see you later. We can't help you. We don't have what you need to match. So we had to pull each and every kid out of property and count them manually, one by one by one by one. The problem is, is this is evidence. This is crime scene evidence. You can't just like walk in and start counting it, you know, because I'm, I'm a professor at a university. You got 10,000 somethings to be counted, pull the bus up, load the undergrads on. We're gonna bang this out in a day, right? No, <laughs> no, you can't have a whole bunch of undergrads as it turns out touching crime scene evidence. Those are prosecutors, those are the lowest ranking prosecutors in the office as it turns out. They have to go and they have to sit in this room that is literally as hot as this room. And they have to do this with a police officer physically present at all times to maintain what's called chain of custody. 
to verify the evidence has never been tampered, it has never been inappropriately. It is a painstaking process. It took us three months to count, and they counted 11,303 sexual assault kits when all was said and done. They went back to 1980 to 2009, which was when we ended our, our count. 30 years of untested rape kits. We had victims, pediatric victims, infants, toddlers, children. We had adolescent victims. We had adult victims. We had elderly victims. It was the full gamut. We did the best we could through the examination of the outside of the box to try to guess if it ever went to the lab. So we would check to see, is the seal broken? Is there any indication, like the lab initials? And it looked like of those about 8,700 we could verify had never gone to the lab. And I said, OK, this is going to be our sample. We'll, we'll look on the other ones later. But right now, for this project, let's focus on the 8,700 that were never submitted for um, crime scene testing. So the question is, is, how do you get this many untested kits in police property? So I wanted to take, as a community psychologist, a systemic approach to this question. And what I mean by that is, is this working assumption that this is a problem that is rooted in long-standing relationships within key organizations and between organizations. You don't get 11,000 kits sitting in police property storage because one person or one organization didn't do its job. This is a massive systemic breakdown, and we need to look at it from a systems perspective. So a systems perspective means I need to look at all of the different organizations that make up the criminal justice system, and then I need to see how that criminal justice system interfaces with other social systems. So I need to understand what was happening in the police department, the crime lab, and the prosecutor's office over the 30-year history that these kids are accumulating. What's happening in the three organizations in the criminal justice system? I also need to know what's happening in the medical system because remember, the whole way this kit comes to be is a doctor or nurse collected the evidence. So I need to know what was happening in Detroit emergency departments over the 30-year history that these kits were accumulating. We don't get a kit if a survivor doesn't come forward to report, so my question then becomes, who was helping the survivors? Where was the advocacy community, social workers, community mental health and like? Where were they in helping victims through the exam? Where were they in terms of the advocacy at the organizational level to say, hey, what's happening in our community? What's happening with kids? What's happening with prosecution? The way I pitched this to our interdisciplinary uh, team was is I'm an equal opportunity um, examiner. I'm going to look at all of us. It's not just the police. And the police are like, oh, thank goodness. We thought we were going to be under the hot seat. But I got to say, the other organizations were not real thrilled with me starting to poke around because they were absolutely sure it was the police fault, absolutely sure. The only organization that bared any responsibility was the police. And I'm like, hey, you know, research, science, you got to try a lot of different hypotheses. They're like, well, you try it, but you're going to be wrong. I'm like, OK, OK. Oh, boy. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about research methods. This is the one techie slide, and it's not very techie. OK. Archival record review. People would say, oh, we couldn't test the kits because we didn't have enough money. And I said, bring me the budget. Oh, um, we didn't have enough staff. Bring me your staffing plans. Bring me the receipts. You can't just tell me something was a problem. I need to see it in the archives. So actually, I had to consult with various historians. I know I'm like, tell me more about this. Like archive thing that you all do. So we looked at about 140 documents collected from FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, as well as people inside the organization willing to give them to us to really understand the 30-year history and documents across all of these organizations. The police kept saying to us, hey, you know, these, these kids didn't deserve to be tested. They were bad cases. I'm like, okay, great. Let me see some of the reports. They're like, oh, okay. So I said, uh, you know, I'll get to sampling in a minute. We uh, picked 1,600. I could find roughly 12, uh, 1,200 of those reports. So my research team and I read and coded quantitatively and qualitatively 1,268 police reports that were associated with untested kits to sort of understand what was happening at the investigational level. I did interviews with key stakeholders from all of these organizations. I interviewed frontline people, patrol officers, frontline advocates, nurses, all the way up to the highest level in all of these organizations, the elected, the people in charge. 
I found the retired people and interviewed them too to understand because it's a 30 year problem in the making, everybody I need to hear from. And I did a lot of ethnographic observations, about 186 hours down there in the trenches in, in business world, they call it the Gemba, in the Gemba, seeing what was happening in Detroit in these organizations. My method of bringing together all of this quantitative and qualitative data was analytic um, induction. Again, happy to talk more about that in Q&A, but it's a rigorous process of looking at all of your data and coming up with an, empirically, an empirical assertion that the reason why we have these kits is X. Now, go find the ev confirming evidence and the disconfirming evidence of that assertion. And through a constant process of revision and reflection, you end up with a set of final assertions that you have multiple data sources that triangulate to say, this seems to be a reason why we have untested kits. So what did we find? Number one, they didn't have a policy or protocol about rape kit testing. That was like the first question I said, can I see what your policy is? Yeah, uh, we're gonna send that to you. I'm still waiting. Um, they didn't have one. They really truly did not have one. So the decision of whether a rape kit should be sent for forensic testing was entirely up to the individual investigating officer. And that person had no organizational guidance about whether they thought it, whether it should or shouldn't be tested. The circumstances under it, nothing. There's literally nothing. So it's a completely discretionary matter for the, for the police. So that's one reason, because there was no oversight. No oversight, you get a lot of kits building up. The other reason that we saw a lot of untested rape kits was is, is that the three key pieces of the criminal justice system in Detroit truly did have drastic, drastic reductions in their personnel over time. So the Police Sex Crimes Unit, which is the entity within the department that's responsible for investigating sexual assault cases, had a 50% reduction in its staffing levels over the time that these kits were accumulating, not once but twice. A 50% cut, and then a 50% cut of the 50%. When we started our action research project, they had six people. That's not even close to what it needs to be for a city of that size and its crime rate. So they literally did not have the staffing levels in the police department to be able to investigate all of these cases. The crime lab, the DPD crime lab, had two DNA scientists, two. Okay, that doesn't sound like a lot. And I remember when I presented this as an interim finding to NIJ, they're like, mm, that doesn't sound a lot, but can you, can you verify that? I'm like, you're asking me to prove two is small. Sure, I can do that. So I'm like, okay, um, well, at the time many of these kids were accumulating, Detroit was similar in size and crime rate to Dallas. Not in racial and ethnic composition, not a lot of other things, but at least in terms of population and crime rate at that time. Dallas and Detroit were very similar. So I pick up the phone and I call Dallas. I'm like, hey, Dallas, um, how many DNA um, scientists do you have? And they're like, we have two laboratories. I'm like, two laboratories. So they have two full-fledged laboratories, buildings, fully staffed, QI departments, supervisors. We have two people in Detroit. So I send that back to NIJ and I proved water is wet. Two is not enough to keep pace with this. And this is not just rape kits. This is every type of crime scene evidence that you might need DNA evidence for. They had two people. In some ways, it's kind of a drop the mic moment and go home. I mean, there's really, they're not gonna be able to do this, but I keep going. The prosecutor's office has no specialized unit. They are taking whatever is coming in the door and processing it as best they can. They're not thinking about what's not coming in the door because they cannot keep up with what is coming in the door. We have a complete breakdown in personnel in all of the pieces and parts of the criminal justice system in Detroit. They could not keep pace, literally. In addition, they had numerous changes in leadership and supervision. So if there's a problem developing, it's gonna be very hard to catch it. In the Detroit Police Department, they had nine chiefs over the 20 year history where most of the kits were accumulating. Again, does that sound like a lot of turnover, it is. When you look at national uh, data for cities of that size, you would have, you know, the average turnover time is roughly, you know, maybe four to five years. DPD was turning over chiefs every 2.2 years. I had three of them in the time that I was doing this project. The only thing constant is change, is what they kept telling me. When the chief turned over, everybody down to the supervising lieutenant or sergeant of the sex crime unit changed too. 
So if you have problematic investigator, problematic policy, problematic anything, you're not going to find it easily because as soon as you start to get your bearings, you've moved on. So a constant cycle of organizational upheaval makes it very hard to figure out, A, what are we doing? B, is it problematic? And C, what could we do about it? They were treading water, constantly treading water. All right, so I've picked on the criminal justice system a lot. Let's pick on another system for a bit. The medical system. Remember, you can't get this kit unless the doctors collect it. Well, in Detroit, they did not have one of those specialized forensic nurse examiner programs until 2006. That's late. That's really late. So up until 2006, exams were done in Detroit ERs. I've been in them. I've done ethnographic observations in them. They are exactly what you think they are. Okay? It is a very, very chaotic, difficult environment, a lot of crime, a lot of mental health issues where people just end up in the ER. It is everything that you know an urban ER to be and then a rape survivor comes in. So those exams were done by typically the lowest ranking residents who had no training on patient-centered care and literally had no training on how to do the exams. So I tracked down these people and I interviewed them. This was very hard. And I said, you know, so tell me about what training you had to do these exams. They're like, well, in the box, there was that instruction page. It's a page. And when you actually go through the page, it's actually about these many lines of text where they tell you how to actually collect it. And I remember interviewing one of the physicians who's now you know, uh, practicing you know, non-resident anymore, and he <laughs> made this gesture. He's like, yeah, I wasn't really kind of sure what I was you know, testing. I'm like, what is this gesture? And, and I, I was more polite about it than that, but it was this, uh, like I would lift the sheet and I would kind of swab. And, and he has his head turned away. I'm like, so this is how you collected evidence? And he's like, well, yeah, I, I didn't really, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. And I'm like, so then you, 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 <laughs> you put the swabs in the box. I'm still trying to absorb this because you remember a neutral researcher. You're like, hmm, tell me more about this. And I'm like, and then what would you do? Well, I would hand it to the police. And I'm like, what would you tell them? And he, he's like, I would tell them the truth, that I didn't find anything. I'm like, well, dude, you just literally told me you won't even look. <laughs> so, you, I mean, they're like, they were not doing exams functionally. And then they would tell the police, I didn't find anything. I didn't see anything. How is that message heard by police who don't have enough people, don't have enough crime lab, don't have enough prosecutors? It's like, oh, thank you very much, medical system. You just gave me the reason I needed to shelve that kit. The doctor said, there's nothing here. In our society, if the doc, whatever, how many doctors we have here, if the doctor says something, it, I mean, we're, you know, I'm not an MD, but I mean, even as a PhD, I can get a lot of, a lot of mileage out of just the doctor said. So an MD saying there's nothing here, the police are like, hey man, doc said there's nothing here. So the medical system is very much a contributor to this problem. In fairness, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have any training on it. The instructions were about four lines of text, and they're trying to handle gunshot wounds and, and, and you know, all kinds of mental health issues coming through the door. They couldn't keep pace either. Well, surely advocacy will save the day, right? Advocacy, our social work, social workers, clearly we're going to have, and psychologists, we're going to put on the cape and we're going to fix this, right? We are going to help survivors. We are going to advocate for change. That's what the field of social work did. Um, the problem was is community-based advocacy services were pretty much non-existent in Detroit. We had one advocate, one person on average. One person is not changing what is happening in all of these other places. It is not possible. So where did this leave survivors? Pretty much on their own. It was a massive systemic breakdown. One of the detectives I interviewed said the kits that weren't tested were the cases we couldn't or wouldn't do anything about. I just showed you couldn't. They literally couldn't. They had a complete lack of resources. This was very strong in Detroit. I will tell you, I still see this in other jurisdictions all throughout the United States. Maybe not to the same level of depletion, but still depletion. So couldn't is very much part of our explanation here. Read the quote. Couldn't or wouldn't. Every qualitative researcher went ding, 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 ding. Tell me more about wouldn't. Well, that's where we need to focus on the police in depth. When I interviewed them about why they wouldn't, investigate these cases, what I heard over and over again was widespread um, disbelief and victim blaming of sexual assault survivors. 
little mini quotes from all of the different interviews I did. Um, she's not acting like a real victim because she wasn't demonstrably upset. This is a he said, she said thing. Uh, why was she there in the first place? This isn't rape, it's just a deal gone bad, meaning it's prostitution. Um, what did she expect? Being with him, everyone knows he's a convicted felon. Um, she's lying to cover something up. They would be incredibly forthcoming with me in the interviews that they didn't test these kits because they didn't merit testing, because they didn't believe these victims and they weren't worth doing it. So I pulled the police reports. Take a second on that one. This is an actual police report. This is a 14-year-old girl who was abducted off the street and sexually assaulted by two black men. Um, they call her a heifer. They pretty much accuse her of lying. It's, yeah. When I showed this to the chief in our debriefing, he said that this is not our best investigational work. I'm like, wow, that's a euphemism. That acronym at the bottom means unable to establish elements of the crime. So a 14-year-old girl comes in, she says she's been sexually assaulted. They say they're unable to establish the elements of the crime. The police report is a cover sheet in this document. There's no investigation. There's no effort to find this person. There is no, they unable to establish the elements of the crime. Dude, you didn't even try. Didn't even try. I'll also fast forward and say when we pulled this kit and tested it, guess what? It hit to four other rape kits. All the time, all of them are adolescent girls abducted off of the street and sexually assaulted by two men. They were serial rapists. Didn't believe them, didn't test it. We keep going through, we keep seeing more and more. The, the lie has already been uncovered and confirmed. It appears to be a false report. The story's not checking out as claimant said. You wanna know what wasn't checking out? Exact time. She said it was like 8, 8.30. It turned out to be 9 p.m. Oh, she's lying. Any inconsistency, any small thing, they're like, nope, this, she's not telling the truth. Um, this complainant is deep. Um, she tells this story, no tears, none. The times are off. When I talked with the doctor, all he found was a little white discharge, no trauma. Who can figure it? Smiley face, good luck. No tears, none. Their idea of what trauma looks like is a demonstrable hot mess. In this circle, we know trauma manifests a lot of different ways, and you're not always going to have somebody who's going to be demonstrably upset. But because she wasn't having that profile, and the times were slightly off. Again, we're talking about like 30 minute difference. They think she's not telling the truth. And then the doctor says, I didn't see anything. And they're like, we're gonna go ahead and shelve this one. And again, it wasn't tested. When we tested it, it hit, it hit to other results. So one of the things we also discovered in this project was a fundamental misunderstanding of trauma, how trauma manifests, how people behave under trauma. So that's kind of how I got started doing trainings on the neurobiology of trauma, translating research to practice so that they could really understand how trauma works. They had no training on trauma. I asked them about this and they said, the training on trauma I have is showing up every day in Detroit as a police officer. That is my training. I'm like, I think we can do better than that. I think the fields of psychiatry, psychology, social work have something a little bit better offered you. The police were incredibly receptive to this training. They're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. They had no idea. So we're back to our problem. A whole bunch of people, 11,000 people, went to the police, reported a crime, had a sexual assault kit collected, nothing ever happened with it. What's a possible solution? I have an idea. Why don't we try testing these rape kits? Let's see what happens. So we had to develop a testing plan to move forward with these kits. Detroit did not have the resources at that time to submit all 8,700. We had mm, roughly money for 1,600. And that's another wonderful moment in writing a grant. Remember, you're justifying your sample size and you do your power analysis. Uh, this sample size is determined by budget. Um, this is what we had to test. And so the statistician was like, you can have this many variables. I'm like, oh, I want all these variables. And she's like, you can have this many. <laughs> okay, okay. So 1,600, um, again, I won't go into the technical details. It's a stratified random sample. So we have some old kits, some new kits, some stranger and some non-stranger. I can go into more details later, but that's the gist. Old kits, maybe beyond the statute of limitations, newer kits, stranger, non-stranger. Regardless of whether the police thought they should be tested, they kept saying, oh, no, no, that one doesn't need to be tested. I remember that one. I'm like, oh, no, it was a stratified random sample. This is how research works. Um, just, 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 just try it. Just let me, let me, and they're like, you're wasting your time. I'm like, that's fine. That's what research is. We waste our time. Let me just go ahead and submit it, and we'll see what happens. 
So we submit them for forensic testing and 49% of them have a DNA profile that's eligible for upload into CODIS. This was much bigger than we expected because they hadn't been stored under great conditions, remember literally a parking lot, they hadn't been collected in an ideal way, you know, the swab. So we weren't sure we were gonna get very many profiles that would go into CODIS. So fi about 50% of those kits yielding something that met the alleles, the biological standards to go into CODIS, this was a lot. And from that, there were 455 CODIS hits, meaning a match to an identified offender in CODIS. So about 28% overall, about 58% of the cases that had a CODIS upload. This number was supposed to be zero, right? Because these didn't happen, that, that nothing happened. These are not the ones worth doing. One of them said, so we had 455 cases reopen overnight because we now have a hit. We do a bunch of statistical analyses. We see statistically equivalent CODIS hit rates for stranger and non-stranger. So whether the victim knew the offender or not isn't predicting whether there's a CODIS hit. It's not just non-significant. We do equivalence testing. The rates are equivalent. You're getting equally likely to have a hit coming out of CODIS whether the victim was a, whether the assailant was stranger or non-stranger. There's a lot of offenders out there. When we drill down further to say, who are you hitting to? 127 of those hits, the reason why their DNA was in CODIS was because they had raped somebody else. 127 of them, it was a serial, suspected serial sexual assault. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna be able to go through these. These are timelines. These are what we call the coulda, woulda, shoulda diagrams. Kit collected, kit collected, shelved, another rape happening, another rape happening. That's all this diagram says. The stuff on the right side could have been prevented if the stuff on the left side had ever been tested. That's the moral of this story. What was the impact of this? Seeing so many hits, one of the detectives said it was a game changer. This is a longer quote, but worth listening to. He said, remember, these were the ones not tested because whatever, they didn't matter, the victims were lying, the victims were this or that, but then bam, every month, the forensic science team representative brings that update, that tracking chart I just showed you, to the meeting, saying we have this many hits, this many serials. The proof was in that chart every month showing the numbers, showing that the way we've been thinking about this was wrong, flat out wrong. Science changed somebody's opinion. The data changed the way they thought about this. We tested the kits they didn't think were gonna make any difference. We tested them, the data said, you need to pay attention. You need to look at these cases. So from that, we are able to launch into a variety of policy reforms at the local and national, local, state and national level. So the first thing that came from this was presenting all of those staffing data back to the governor's office, the attorney general's office, state funders, and said, you need to rebuild personnel levels in Detroit. The, they, they need help. They need police, they need prosecutors, and they've been able to get the levels up in all of the organizations to where they should be given Detroit's crime rate. Second major policy change that came from this project was a policy that said, how about we have a policy? <laughs> All new kits that come in the door, if the victim has released it for testing, it needs to go to the lab for testing. This is not discretionary anymore. We need to move these cases forward. And they got money from the Attorney General's office to go back and test all of the old ones. So now all 11,000 have now been tested in Detroit, all of them. We create a new legislation in Michigan that says all kits released for victims statewide need to be tested. I got to go give testimony before the House Committee when they were considering this law. So research to practice, showing the data, showing the quant data, the qualitative to legislators saying there's good reason to go test these kits. There's a lot of information here about um, offenders and offender behavior. We also created a pilot tracking project. It was a bad day in the research team meeting when one of the prosecutors threw her hands up and said, tell me why it is. I can go on Zappos and order a pair of shoes and I know where my shoes are at any time from that point to when they show up on my doorstep, but a rape survivor won't know where kid is. I'm gonna call UPS. I'm like, okay. She called UPS. UPS is like, we actually know how to track things. And, and so they sent a team out and they said, we can build you a tracking system. 
We have this tracking system in Detroit. We have something, a different model, because then it got, you know, proprietary, what happens when businesses come into the play. But we now have a statewide tracking system, so you can log in and know exactly where your kid is at any point, just like you would know if you ordered a pair of shoes from Zappos. And finally, we created a new model policy of investigational practice. They did not, we're not doing, as that detective said, as the chief said, not our best investigational work. So great, let's create a, a statewide task force, let's bring in leaders from the outside, let's bring in criminal justice researchers, what should be best practice, and created a new model, C, model policy, and we've been training on it throughout the state ever since. So a lot of changes happened here in Michigan, and we've shared our data at the national level, and we've been going around to other places that have these problems, and so there's been a lot of national changes too. So 32 states now have passed some type of rape kit reform legislation, either requiring auditing, tracking, testing. 20 states now say you have to test all new kits. Eight states so far have said you need to go back in time and get your old ones. The Bureau of Justice Assistance has created what we call the Sex Sexual Assault Kit Initiative Project. $110 million, 41 sites, 11 which are entire states. So now I crisscross the country working with other jurisdictions that haven't tested their kits. And I have to say, I've never been sadder to see my findings replicate over and over again. It feels like Groundhog's Day a lot. I'm sitting down in these cities over and over again. I don't see the same resource depletion as in Detroit, but I'm seeing the same variables, the same effects quantitatively. I'm seeing that same CODIS hit rate coming out in city after city after city. There's a lot of very valuable information in these kits that can really help change the criminal justice response. And there's been tremendous media attention about this issue. Maybe you guys have seen or heard about this. It's a documentary called I Am Evidence. It is on HBO. I'm gonna, if the tech works, try to show you a little clip from it. I always was told, someone touches you, you tell, you tell, you tell. They did a rape kid on me. There's some bot that we can catch on. today about the number of rape cases police have never even tried to solve. I have no clue. People stop how rape kits. Rape kits. Untested. Never opened, never tested. I was shocked. There was just racks in an abandoned warehouse with windows open and birds flying around. I can understand one city being negligent, but a nation? When you find out that you have thousands of kits, what do you do? We had to bring justice to these victims. Rape kit backlog is the most shocking demonstration of how we regard these crimes. There were rapists who were not caught. I can't understand what was so unimportant about me. What were you wearing that particular morning? What they see doesn't look like a real victim. Violence against women is a lower priority. All of these kits should be tested. There are rape kits that haven't been processed across this nation. And those kits start getting results every day. We get another. 20 to 30 hits. Over 700 identified serial rapes, just in one city, in one county, in one state. Of course we made mistakes. We didn't realize the potential. You can't change or fix what happened to one person. What you can change is what might happen to someone else. When you get that list of names and it just scrolls down and it doesn't stop, this is something where we can't rest. You don't tell me what I can and can't do. All it takes is focus, dedication, and commitment. The system should be more accountable. I am evidence that this is not just a kit, this is a person. So that film chronicles Detroit. You could hear my voice. I'm in that. My 12-year-old daughter saw a cut of it, and she's like, oh, Mommy, I'm so proud of you. Mm -hmm. And you needed your highlights touched up before filming. <laughs> <laughs> keeping it real, baby, keeping it real. It follows Detroit, it follows Los Angeles, it follows Cleveland, three cities that have done a lot. You heard Prosecutor Worthy mention 700 serial kit rapists. By the time we tested all the rape kits in Detroit, that's what we're up to now, 700 serial offenders. So check it out. I mean, it's, it's you know a little sensationalized. It's a little Hollywood. But it also gives you, I think, a good feel for not just Detroit, but really the national scale problem. So we've pushed this rock uphill. You know, we have, we're testing kits, we've got the government giving funding to test the kits. What is the impact gonna be? 
I don't know. You know, invite me back in a couple years and I'll either tell you the rock went down the other side or it rolled right back on this. I do want to highlight though that DNA is something we need to be think mindful about. It really strengthens the carceral state. In Detroit, these are predominantly black men. In Cleveland, predominantly black men. We're collecting more and more DNA evidence about low-income men of color to prosecute them. And at the same time, who are the victims? Low-income black women in many of these cities. This is very much, as we were learning as we move across the country, a racialized pro problem. Women most at risk for being sexually assaulted and most at risk for being treated negatively by our social systems are the ones not getting help. The, in Detroit, they, one of our stakeholders says these were poor black women who wanted justice. They reported in spite of what the police do to us as poor black women. The crimes committed against us must be recognized and the rapists must be held accountable. So both are true. So we'll see what happens um, in Detroit. We are seeing the cases moving forward. We are seeing investigations and prosecutions. They have about 300 convictions to date. They keep moving. They're going to move through as many of them as they can. And we'll see. We'll see if this will push the rock over to the other side or whether it's going to roll right back down on us. But it has been an interesting cycle of success and failure and success and failure and a way that we can take research and put it into practice in the here and now to try to help one city and one community. Thank you.